Welcome to Australian Hunger, I'm your host Ben, and on this show today I've got an interview with Adnate, a Brisbane post metal band. I'll be getting to that in a few minutes, but before that I want to discuss a really important issue, one that I think will be coming up quite a few times um, as the show progresses. So, one thing that often has kind of made me conflicted about music and how I view bands is the personal lives of the musicians who make the music that we love so much and how our relationship changes to those musicians and how our support should change based on their personal behaviour. Now, obviously, there's a great deal of personal behaviour for a musician which we shouldn't care about. You know, the kind of religion they have, as long as it sort of is restricted to a sort of personal domain, the, you know, a bunch of things, like just a lot of personal preferences that aren't really relevant to anyone. But then there's a great extent of personal behaviour which... I think we should care about. It's kind of a difficult thing because punishing people for the things they do in private when really our only relationship to them is a public thing is complicated. It's really complicated. When does this response get activated? When does this response become too much? The reason I'm talking about this is As I Lay Dying was dropped from Resurrection Fest because it was an outcry. For those who remember, the lead singer Tim Lambesis was arrested and went to jail for trying to solicit a hitman to kill his estranged wife. He served two years out of a six-year sentence and was released and has slowly been working to get As I Lie Dying back together. The other band members were initially not really receptive to that, but it seems that, you know, the, the band, as as of the time of him going to jail, is all come back on board, and they're, they've gotten together, released a music video, and setting up a tour. And, you know, obviously, this appearance at Resurrection Fest was all part of, you know, getting back together, setting up some touring, playing shows. I want to read a little bit of their statement about the dropping, Given the controversy after the announcement of As I Like Dying for next year, we would like to highlight our absolutely condemnatory position against gender violence. At the festival, we are aware that it is a huge problem in society with which we must have a special sensitivity. And yeah, I think that's really important. So in this particular issue, he's gone to jail. He's served, you know, time. Is enough time? What is enough time? Interesting question. But I don't, haven't really seen... I haven't really seen, and to be fair, I don't follow As I Lie Dying particularly quickly, but I haven't really seen much public apologies for that. And I think it's really important to demonstrate that he's, you know, apologised, he's shown some measure of repentance, because for him, for us to support him after he's done something so horrific, I mean, if he had have been, gone through with it as he wanted, his wife would have been killed because whatever personal things happen between them, that's a really horrific thing. That's one of the real problems of society. Um, men in particular, although not exclusively men, men in particular approaching their, their partners with violence, you know, sometimes killing them because, uh, you know, just uh, because of the personal relationship between them. Domestic abuse, horrific thing. Um, the, the amount of progress we've made in the relationship of women to society and to men has really improved in the past 50 years. Uh, but, like, this is still an incredible problem. And to do something that, that, that terrible, you really need to demonstrate that you've changed, that, you know, your, that, that particular action, you've somehow grown from that. You've learned and you've become a member of society, which we want to, you know, encourage support. And, you know, if, if we're, we've misjudged him, if he has made that change and he just hasn't demonstrated it yet, then this is a terrific opportunity for him to do that, for him to come out after resur- the dropping of him from Resurrection Fest and to really demonstrate that he's been changed by this experience of being arrested and gone to jail and that he understands what he's done was wrong, and he, he's done some form of, I don't know, repentance. I don't... It's a difficult thing, because what what is required after these situations to demonstrate that you deserve support again, that you can be accepted back into the community? I don't know. But after you've done something that bad, that malevolent within society, it, it needs to be a lot. It needs to be a lot. And you can't just come back. You can't just come back. There needs to be more than that. There are plenty of bands who have, you know, I assume admirable personal lives and, you know, we should be supporting them and not allowing um, people who've done really bad things and haven't properly repented for it to occupy the public space. 
So I talked to Adnate just earlier to this evening. Really, really glad to talk to all three of the members of the band. You know, as I mentioned in an earlier episode, it, it can be a little bit difficult, but I think it's really rewarding because you get the interplay between all the members. Um, chatting about their latest album released in September, Neo Dryas. Um, yeah, really, really cool chat, and I appreciate them talking to me. I did something a little bit different in this particular interview. Usually I play two, two or three songs of theirs during the interview, but this, oh, I don't know. Because of the way I structured it, because they only had a few songs in the album, a few long songs, I we, we, we chatted about each song briefly, and I put a sample of each during that section. Um, and yeah, I just couldn't think of which particular song I wanted to include, maybe the end or something. So I just didn't include that. I've, I've just got samples of each song there. I, th- I think that was that's, that's the approach I wanted to take for this particular one. So without further ado, Ad Nate. Let's start at the very beginning. How did the band start? Oh, it was oh. 2009? Yeah, 2009, 2010, something like that. Yeah, we had just, both Albert and I had previously left bands and both Dog Isis and a bunch of other post-metal bands and decided to jam. Yeah, I think that was Blaze's original pitch to me was, do you want to make a band and we kind of will make stuff that sort of sounds similar to Isis and Neurosis? And I was like, yeah, that sounds like fun. Each of you, uh, introduce yourselves and what part you play in the band. All right, I'm Blaze. I play the bass and make vocal sounds. Uh, I'm Albert. I play guitar and synthesizers. And I'm Dave and I play drums and I record, I guess, and soundscape so yeah nice nice it's good that um it's a nice sort of compact three piece with all you guys sort of doing multiple stuff you've been really efficient there cheers man <laughs> so where'd the name come from oh that's elvis <laughs> oh uh well it did uh, it is like a biological term but it just means um joined by having grown together i thought it was sort of fitting because we incorporate a lot of different elements together into one sound dryas is also a biological term is is that was that intended to be a reference to the sort of the the plant the oak no not necessarily it's more in reference to um to the massive cataclysmic events of the younger dryas that happened i think about 10 11 thousand years ago Mm. We, we were trying to think of a name that was was some type of like gigantic cataclysmic you know heavy heavy themed kind of a, a thing mm, no yeah it definitely sort of captures that um i always love it when i have to sort of look up uh words and figure out what they're meaning and like oh i didn't actually know about the driest no, that's great <laughs> <laughs> yep. yeah um so the band started in 2009 as you guys mentioned from what i can tell on facebook you were doing some stuff 2013 uh ish you guys dropped out what happened oh basically we just our drummer kind of went on a hiatus and it eventuated us into going on a hiatus as well and i got drunk last year and decided that we should jam again (laughs) and they roped me into it somehow and uh the rest is history so you guys mentioned that uh, bands like Isis, Neurosis, uh, the influences, the, the kind of stuff that you wanted to play. Why is it that those particular sounds have attracted you? Yeah, that's a good question, man. That is a good question. So, I, I find there's a huge honesty in that that kind of genre of music, I guess. Like, um, there's, uh, I don't know, I, I, I've always had like this kind of dark undercurrent to my, my normal chipper self. Um, and I don't know, just having that, that brutal sound just mixed with this kind of like nice organic kind of earthy kind of sound really, I don't know, speaks volumes to, to my musicality at least. And I know, I know very much to these guys as well. Yeah. Yeah. That sums it up pretty well. Just, yeah, the honesty and they, not gimmicky. Every, I think that was my thing when I wanted to do Adnate, I was sick of like gimmicky black and death metal i played in a black death metal band and i was just 
wanted something a bit more honest because I come from more of a punk background. Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> I come from a, a pop punk background. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just something a bit more uh, true to self. Yeah. That, that's interesting. What did you find gimmicky about the black and death metal band? Uh, it just... The the like I, I still love black metal and death metal, but it's it's kind of like a um parody of itself. I yeah, guess. I think <laughs> I think it became well, and there's there's still a, an enormous amount of great music within within these genres, but I think it it became so over homogenized at one point that everything was just very stereotypical of a specific form and everyone was just doing something because that's what everyone else was doing. It's sort of yeah. all the soul got squeezed out somewhere at some point. Mm, um, and coming from the, I can't remember who that was. It's, it's a little bit difficult when you're uh, got all the people on the phone, but um, <laughs> sorry, man, <laughs> that, that, that's all right. We'll, we'll work through it. Um, the, <laughs> I'm sorry to address you like this, but the, the pop punk one, oh, um, Dave, yeah. Dave, um, <laughs> So that's sort of a, a bit of a gulf between that and the kind of music you're playing now in terms of like so so many different ways, almost every single way. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. How, why are you in this band as opposed to just playing in a pop punk band? Um, well, I, I got first exposed to, I guess, metal in the form of the band Zao, which was like a, a huge uh, gear shift for me. I was... I was a good Christian boy back in the day. And um, he was this like metal, um, Christian metal at that point band. And I I don't know if they still associate themselves, but that was just mind blowing to me that like people could actually be this angry and it sounds just so incredible. And I I just got sucked into it and I always wanted to to get into this. And I, I never found the bands in the, in the Brisbane scene to really, to fill that void until we we ended up filling that void together in a, a beautiful manly way. <laughs> <laughs> mm, so drunk call uh, in 2017. Yeah. So it's been what a couple of years since you guys stopped playing together. Did you pick it up exactly where you left off, or were there any changes to the way you guys were operating sounded um, when you you reignite the flame? Uh, it was pretty much like we had never stopped jamming. We got in and wrote what, yeah. a whole song in a space of an hour, and it yeah. felt like no time had changed whatsoever. Yeah. So were you writing new songs for this album, or was there anything left over from some of the work you'd previously done? Uh, there were there was a couple, like a couple of riffs that got recycled, um, but pretty much the entirety of it, uh, we started writing in January, so we so we wrote it, uh, recorded it, and released it all within the space of eight months. Eight months, yeah. yeah. So, have, uh, writing that music, do you guys? I don't know. Do you have a, a process between you all about how you um, were working on this material? Um, it just sort of comes out organically, like. I don't know how we do it. It's <laughs> it starts usually with drums or oh, not drums. <laughs> Actually, drums come last. No, it comes. It, last. It's usually guitar or bass, and these guys kind of like back and forth, and I don't know. We we kind of jam it out and really bring it to life as quickly as we can, just to capture what we're trying to convey musically, I guess, um, or emotionally. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Are we emotional people? It's definitely emotive music. Yeah. Like, and we don't overcomplicate the songs as well. Our ethos has always been, you know, make it organic is pretty much yeah. us. Mm, no, that, that's definitely good. I mean, a lot of, like, I think post-rock, post-metal is a very rich genre, but, yeah, there definitely can be some bands who just try to overcomplicate it. Like, like, like some of the prog bands. Um, with, with recording the album, how did you go about that? Um is the Dave the the Dave that's listed as yes. the mixing? Oh, okay, cool. So, what, what was the process for recording? It was a home recording, a home recording studio recording. Yeah, it was a home recording. Um, so we we basically um, we were just going to do like a live sort of demo of these songs, and um, we were having trouble with the the audio interface we had. So I decided to just jump in and buy a better one. And I had the money sitting there. I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm actually just going to build a home studio. I've always wanted to. 
no idea how to use it. I've done mixing before, but uh, not at this scale, not at an album scale. And so we started tracking and um, just piece by piece put it together over, I think it was 10 weeks of recording, I think, but that was about it. And that was it. We were done. Um, all, all at my place, bedroom recording, just, yeah, really bare bones. But, yeah, um, we just wanted to capture that that live sound that um, we have in our jams, I guess, <laughs> and um, what we would on stage, but um, in, in I, I guess, a more fleshed out and more visceral sound of um, recording. So using the ability to layer as much as possible. <laughs> Now, with obviously post metal being a you know the genre of metal rock, whatever you want to call it, like it obviously involves guitar, sometimes vocals, drums, bass, sometimes like a synth or a keyboard. But the soundscapes they're kind of a bit novel to this particular album. Where, where do they come from? Why was the decision made to you know include that as part of your music? Um. I, I don't remember the discussion, but we kind of turned it into kind of a found footage kind of vibe with, I don't know, this earthly kind of feel. I don't really remember the, the conversation. Well, I think originally all of the live performances that we used to do, uh, we used to organise each uh, performance for a specific show that we were doing. So if we had a 40-minute set, it would be 40 minutes. And we'd get songs and we'd link them together by just sort of putting some sort of, like, ambient noise or, like, uh, held synthesizer note or feedback or something. Kind of, yeah, yeah kind sort of, of in between it to kind of, like, tie everything together. But obviously when we were recording, we had a bit more time and and a lot more sort of things at our disposal to be able to put those different things in there to to emulate the same kind of thing that we would do with a live set the structure of the album it's sort of the three main songs seem to be kind of focusing that on that old kind of tree of birth well in this case rebirth but birth life and destruction why, why did you choose to structure it in in that way uh that's i don't know man i it's just how the lyrics sort of came about and how i felt the songs flow but yeah i we just it's sort of like the cycles of life i guess you know you've got leads to that natural progression of of life just generally and that organic kind of vibe we're going for i guess Yeah. yeah Like, yeah, just the circle of life sort of thing <laughs> to get all Lion King on this one. But yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it just seemed like a natural progression. Now, you mentioned the lyrics. How did you work on those? Uh, was it you primarily, um, Blaze, or were the other guys involved? How, how did that work between you all? Um, yeah, I, I usually write the lyrics at home by myself like with just dictaphone recordings of the jams. Um, yeah, it just happens as an organic process. I think of vocal melodies and, yeah, it often just resemblance resembles sort of earth-based themes and to an extent, I guess, a little bit of spirituality. And what drew you to this idea of, uh, you know, the neodriasis, the new kind of cataclysm, new destruction? What drew you, that, uh, drew you to that theme? I think the themes, a lot of the times, the themes come after the the compositions themselves. So a lot of the time we write and we'll be playing it or like we'll be practicing together and we'll be, we'll be writing the music. And then it's only sort of after we listen to it and experience how the composition goes that we assign a theme to it. And with this one, like through the changes throughout, the entirety of it and towards the end we just felt it had this really really strong powerful dark destructive force that just sort of came out so we we had to think of a a fitting way to to title it and to to give it a theme i suppose having you know some a few short long songs we have kind of a 
good opportunity that I don't normally have to like kind of go through the album track by track. Um, a Call to Prayer, a short um, kind of introductory track. part does that play on this album i think it just wakes people's ears up a little bit <laughs> it's just it's that's hilarious actually <laughs> yeah no i think it i think it's just like a, a slow sort of uh an introduction to you know something is coming mm. it's it's a bit brooding and it's a bit ethereal and it's it's got a lot of different elements in it and it sort of leads the listener in to to what follows it and also lulls them into a false sense of security when the the heavy bit drops in rebirth in track two (laughs) which is (laughs) just a beautiful wall Uh, (laughs) um so there's a a a noise of the the uh film rolls of the old style film roll starting up which reoccurs in the uh final track cataclysm like conceptually what what is that supposed to like mean like why why is it kind of a a found footage kind of vibe you're going for um i i don't really like i i've kind of always imagined like since, since we've been like working these songs and through the recording process just the idea of finding like an old film reel in like an old dusty attic and just slapping it on, and this is the soundtrack to just this like chaotic mess of of, of different visual, um, you know, footage, I guess. And um, it just kind of I don't know. I've always imagined like just like a five year old finding it and <laughs> just being like shocked to to complete silence and almost a catatonic state as it just like rolls off the reel. I don't know. That's that's. <laughs> That's what I've always visualized. I don't know if that's what we actually went for, um, but I, I guess conceptually, that's that's where my head's always been. Mm, that's interesting. <laughs> it's, it's a funny <laughs> oh. image. <laughs> um, so, Rebirth, can you talk a little bit about that track?
I, I don't know. Just I, I kind of don't have any particular questions about Rebirth. Like, just tell us a little bit about like how that track developed. Um, that was just riffs on riffs on riffs, riffs on riffs. That yeah. just sort of just came out, really. Yeah. I didn't. We don't typically like to um, write stuff that has repetition or repeating parts that often. So I just kind of push to see how many different transitions and like how how far you can evolve the composition simply by just transitioning to a different riff that follows into another riff and trying to build the intensity through towards the end basically mm. yeah that was the first song we wrote when we started jam again again in january yeah and it's changed a lot since we started as well it's it's gone through a lot of revisions so. yeah yeah a very apt title then, uh, Rebirth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <absolutely. laughs> um, s- Same question for Convergence, and I've got a, a supplementary question for it. Uh, awesome. Well, Convergence sort of just started with that bass riff I wrote, one jam, and we just literally just jammed on it. Yeah. And it yeah. turned into a thing. Yeah, that was very much a, uh, like a live composition i suppose you would say we sort of we we wrote it as we were playing it and it just turned out that way Mm, now there's a sample at the end um of someone talking draw that sample from uh so that's we we found like a russian cosmonaut um supposedly like from the 60s or something during the um space race and basically it's her burning up as she enters the atmosphere Uh, phantom cosmonaut (laughs) look it up (laughs) that's dark (laughs) oh yeah 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 it's bleak man no, that's interesting because you talk a lot about the, the the concept of earthiness. Like, why include something which is kind of the opposite of Earth? Like the the you know it, it, in the atmosphere, the spacey you know, lack of Earth. Well, I mean, when it, when it really comes down to it, like the elements of Earth are present everywhere in the universe. We're all one giant swirling mess of of atoms. So, I think it's kind of fitting. I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess when we wrote it, I always heard, like, I wanted disembodied voices there. And, yeah, Davey showed me it, and it it was exactly what I was hearing, so we went with it. Yeah. Uh, the last track, you've got uh, J.S. of Indica performing vocals.
do you want him to guest on this particular track? Uh, so that that the start of that song is actually, I I wrote that as a piece for a project me and him are working on, and it was going to be an a cappella piece. And when I brought it forth to Adnate, I wanted to honor that. You know, I wrote it with Jay for JS to perform with our project, so it felt right bringing him in. Mm. And also, I'm not comfortable with my singing voice, and he is amazing. So he definitely is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it worked well. Like we're good friends, and it just seemed fitting. Um, any other notes you want to share on that particular track? It was fun. <laughs> yeah, that was. We probably, I think the the second part of the song. With the um, the much heavier parts, I think we had the most fun yeah. writing that. I think that was definitely in in the practice space. That one kind of hit a lot harder than the others because we could kind of really crank it up and just really hammer it out. It yeah, was, yeah, it was very enjoyable. And it was a really good feeling in studio at the end as well. Like once we'd finished the the initial mix down of that and hearing that, I remember we were all just sitting against the wall in my office and just just goosebumps, like just this wall of of absolute anger and destruction and greatness it was it was nice it was a nice bonding moment <laughs> <laughs> mm, um so with the album like it, it ends and it calls back again to the um the the end of uh to the the end of the album calls back to the beginning with the the uh, the, the film role winding out and you've got the idea of of rebirth as the, the the second track is sort of beginning of the main musical pieces, is it like a is it kind of hinting at uh, being cyclical in any way? Definitely, man. Definitely. Mm, so, what was it? What, why did you choose that approach rather than kind of just like the ideas of just like you know proceeding into destruction? Um, well, that's how everything works. Yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah, that's, that's just reality. how the world works. Yeah. And it was interesting as well because it was. I don't think there was a definitive moment when we chose to do that. It kind of naturally did that on its own, um, and it was kind of afterwards that we kind of clocked on that that it actually like lyrically and uh, I guess musically happened. And we're like, oh, well, cool, that, that's good. Uh, <laughs> happy mistake, I guess. I mean, it was completely deliberate. Um, we are we are definitely definitely smart people. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think it's uh, it's it's funny like that. Some of the best ideas are purely accidental, and like yes. you you might not have generated that idea if you had been thinking, if you had been in the best kind of on a productive mood, creative mood. But like sometimes, just really great ideas just come out of nowhere, and <laughs> it's sort of That's annoying it. like that. That you can't kind of generate them intentionally. You kind of just have to wait for them to happen by accident. That's it. And like, we never really tried to sound or be like anything in particular when making this. So, um, this, this whole album has been prone to a lot of happy mistakes and riffs that we've accidentally discovered during a jam or a new drum beat that we've retracked well after we've, we've locked a track because it was way better. Um, you know, it's, it's just been a a constant organic process. So yeah, it definitely leans itself to it. And DIY recording, that was a fun learning curve. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> no, it's interesting. I've been speaking to quite a few people who've done DIY recording, and yeah, it's, a, it's amazing the kind of stuff that people can put out these days. And it's also really interesting because it kind of allows you a lot of freedom in a lot of ways and also allows you to go back, like you said, retracking the that particular, uh, particular drum section. Um, yeah retrack stuff in a way that you might not have otherwise able to do if you had to book studio time that's it and i mean the the price factor alone is a huge deal but usually like you know you book a block of time and you've got to be rehearsed you've got to be ready there's not much like if you if you're a small band like us like we don't have the money to throw for 10 weeks in a studio but if i own the studio (laughs) and people can come over on the weekend and we can track out like it's so much more free form and it's um, there, there's less pressure and it's it's a much more conducive environment to um, a positive creative yeah. process. Yeah, definitely the most relaxing recording experience I've ever had. So, have you done a, a, a bunch of recording in studios before? Um, my background was more in the live scene, um, doing um, plenty of shows and tours with other bands, and obviously being a drummer and 
various bands, but um, I, I've always leaned towards home recording. I, I kind of jumped into um, into electronic music back in 2011, just trying it out, and I, I found some artists that kind of resonated with me a bit, and I wanted to see if I could pull it off. And turns out, you know, it's it's generally relatively easy. Um, <laughs> Not, not that I, you know, was great at it, but like, um, just the realization, I guess, that the, um, the, the process is very achievable to anyone. Um, and yeah, I, I guess jumping in and, um, like cutting my teeth, teeth in the studio environment was much different to live. There's, there's less rogue elements to deal with in some ways, but there's plenty more in others. Um, so it was definitely a learning experience and definitely a, um, an eye opener into the world of studio life. Yeah. Yeah, it was every other recording I've been part of, you know, you've paid money to be there. So that's always sort of nagging you in the back of your mind. You're not relaxed enough to really just let go and record. Yeah. Like if you mess up, you get, you know, a bit shitted off with yourself. Yeah, like there's this, this like internal approaching dome every time the red light comes on where you have to perform yeah. it's like don't fuck it up gotta get it done but in this instance that it sort of uh it removes that element you're very much more relaxed and able to to have as many takes as you want not that we needed them but no, yeah it was it all one good. takes this whole album <laughs> was one takes. um it, it's interesting as well because like um often you'll hand over to an engineer and a mastering um guy and everything else but like we we kind of handled that all ourselves and it was it was good to be able to have that initial like immediate feedback if someone didn't like the levels of something we could start working on that instantly and there was no there was no extra layer to that creative process we could make it sound exactly how we wanted so that was that was quite nice yeah having active input was very good now to sort of the less musical aspects of the album i already asked you about the album title what about the cover art What what is that a photograph of that is a photograph from one of the walls that were painted in Herculaneum in Greece. Greece? Yeah, Greece, when I was over there um, in 2016. And I, we, we were looking at album ideas, like album art ideas, and um, I flicked through, through some of my holiday photos, and that was one that um, I you know, edited and stuff, and the guys liked the look of it. And um, we eventually settled on it. We had a few other ideas, and we settled on that one. It just, I don't know, and it... it it seemed kind of fitting as well because Herculaneum um, was um, like a seaside um, rich district that was also destroyed in the the whole Pompeii incident um, and, you know, that whole cataclysmic um, and rebirth thing um, seemed very fitting because Herculaneum is literally underneath the city, like, baseline, the ground line, whatever you call it, the earth, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know despite all of that chaos, you know, Herculaneum was destroyed and, and forgotten as well. And, um, you know, Athens kind of grew over it. So not Athens, no, not Greece. Wow. Oh man, this is going out too. This is terrible. Um, in <laughs> Italy, in Italy, in yes. Napoli. Yes. Mm. I do apologize to any, any geography gurus and ancient history gurus out there. Yeah, we're musicians. <laughs> Some of us. <laughs> so a little less than a month after the album released, I think it was in late September, uh, you put a picture on Facebook with the comment writing process initiated. Um, this, so this was like just after you put out the album. Uh, what are you working on now? Yeah, well, we've pretty much finished writing another album before we even finished recording this one. Jeez. So, <laughs> surprise! It it needs a lot of work, but the the outlines are pretty well done. So, yeah. so it like we we're now in the process of of fleshing them all out together, and it'll be a long process. Um, but we we've, we've got the outlines, and now it's it's the the hard task of actually playing it together and figuring out what works, what doesn't work, and what's the best way to get everything to flow and yeah. and where the dynamic shift should be and, and all of those little, little tweaks. So we're, it's, yeah, we're just back into it. Yep. Mm, Got to uh, keep moving. Got to keep the cycle going. So, so with the, the you know, the, the next one, 
is it going to are you aiming for something different than in Neo Drys uh, what, what, are, what are you sort of what, what's the goal with this one it's already kind of sounding very different and again it's that organic process like where we're coming up with different song ideas and whatnot we've jammed out quite a lot of this so far and it's it's a very different sound. it's still adnate but like as as it was in Neo Drys but it's it's definitely become its own beast yet again um so if i mean i'm very excited to see where we go with it because it's it's definitely a living entity that we have to try and tame onto a onto a recording yeah. um situation first yeah mm. yeah the beast does need taming yes <laughs> <laughs> in terms of playing live shows do you, do you have any plan in the near future oh um. We're not, well, if someone offered us a gig and it seemed like a good gig to play, we'd definitely do it. But uh, we just want to write as much as possible, I think, is where we all sit at. We all agree that, yeah, a show would be sweet, but we just want to keep the process happening. Like, this is a cathartic process for all of us. So it's we just want to keep writing and putting stuff out there. So if we get gigs, that'd be sweet. But we're all sort of... Being, you know, doing the week, every week doing two gigs for a whole year straight sort of thing. So it's nice not to have to worry about doing yeah. that. Less and, pack downs. It's quite yeah. nice. <laughs> not having to play the same set list every weekend yeah. for, you know, six months straight or whatever. So yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all just want to write. And, yeah, if we get offered a gig, we'd probably take it if it was worth it, but... Yeah, there's there's no intention of playing every weekend, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm, that's fair enough. A couple of other questions about sort of other things. In Brisbane, you mentioned the scene that it didn't really have many bands like you. What, what is the scene like in Brisbane? Uh, there's actually quite a, like, revision of doom metal mm. in Brisbane at the moment, and it's always had its, like, underground black and death metal scene as well. Um to be honest, like we're all fairly removed from the music scene in Brisbane because well, I live on the Gold Coast. David's in. I've only just moved back to Brisbane. <laughs> in Brisbane now, and Elbert's up in Toowoomba still. So, but from what I've like the gigs I've been to, it's mainly like a yeah revision of Stoner Doom and mm. old school black and death metal still. Well, at least that's the gigs I go to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask you a couple of personal questions. Um, when do you all start listening to heavy music? Uh, oh, man. Yeah, I, I, I seriously started listening to it when I was probably 13. Like, I was raised around Pink Floyd, Sabbath, yeah. and ACDC. But, you know, at 13 years old, I was watching Black Sabbath, Paranoid Video, and it just hooked me, and I wanted to be a bass player because Geezer Butler was just cool, a cool dude. And that's where it started for me. I just fell in love with Black Sabbath at 13, and then it progressed from there. Yeah, I think similar for me. Like, my father was always playing Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, Pink Floyd, Doors, just constantly. And I remember riding around in his ute, and he had cassettes. He had, like, cassettes of everything. And I think I must have been... 11 or 12 he gave me he gave me the dark side of the moon uh deep purple live in japan and vol 4 by black sabbath and he was like here you go you can listen to them whenever you want and i guess that was probably the main introduction to it yeah i was i was raised in a good christian family so i was listening to the likes of hillsong and other wonderful hymnals and so forth. And then, yeah, found found Zhao and then kind of branched out. And I think one of the next bands I found was Iced Earth. And um, it kind of went on from there. So um, that was when I was, what, 16 or 17. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Um, with, with all your instruments, like, I, I've sort of been thinking about some of these questions that I asked. And like, when did you start playing your instrument? Like... I I feel like the more interesting question is like maybe, so you pick up your instrument like what why why did you stay stick with it what what was it that kept you going and made you want to get better and better and eventually sort of play music with other people. Uh for me the 
yeah, bass just became like, as I said, music's very cathartic for me. It, you know, I, I, it's just where I put my soul, if that makes sense. Like, not to sound corny or anything, but as soon as I picked up, I had to play guitar before my parents would buy me a bass for my birthday. <laughs> and I hated guitar. I just loved bass. And yeah, ever since like my 14th birthday, I've been playing bass. Like, I remember. I ended up giving myself chronic tendonitis because I'd pay for 36 hours a week. I just, it was my thing to do. I just, I didn't care for anything else but my bass. Mm. So that's me. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, to be honest, why I stuck with guitar. I used to play bass as well. And I learned, well, I learned like rudimentary piano, uh, keyboard, like piano songs in in high school as well. But I think I just liked guitar because it was more accessible to have an acoustic guitar there that you could sort of just pick up whenever, didn't need any gear, and you could just actively, you know, write and and play. And, and I think maybe that's why I stuck with guitar, because it was easier to just pick up and play whenever you want to kind of thing. I, I kind of jumped into drumming in high school and it was like the first thing I was properly good at. And like when you're a teenager, you, you shit at everything. So it was nice to be good at something. Um, and I kind of latched to that, but then really just I fell in love with it, fell in love with, you know, the theory and the um, the gear and the, the you know, the great drummers of the world, et cetera. And just like watching and, and yeah, I just, I couldn't get enough of it. And it's such a, a physical and, um, you know, um, emotional instrument that you can really put yourself into if you really want to. And, um, yeah, so that was me. Mm, so, Blaze, you, men- uh, Blaze, you mentioned that you just didn't like the guitar, you wanted to play bass. What, what was it about a bass that fulfilled you in a way a guitar didn't? I, I, I don't know. Like, it was just something about it. I think it was just how deep and grounded it sounded i guess is probably what drew me to it and I, again like learning black sabbath and that like i learned you know paranoid iron man and all that on guitar but playing it on bass just i don't know something about it just felt more natural and it sort of like again not to sound too corny but it's gonna be pretty cliche like it filled a hole in like that was missing if that makes sense like i was 13 not good at anything picked up bass and it just make me feel great. Mm. Last question, um, and I know it can be a little bit of a difficult one. What are some of your favourite bands or albums? Isis, Panopticon. Definitely. Like of all time or at the moment? No, which, whichever, <laughs> whichever takes your fancy. Oh. Do we just get one? You can have as many as you like. Oh, thank you. <laughs> You're so kind. Well, yeah, Isis Panopticon would be probably in my top five. Tom Waits, Blood Money, mm. definitely up there as well. And Black Sabbath, Black Sabbath. That's mine. There we are. Opeth, Blackwater Park. Um, oh, God. Anything by Zhao. Um, <laughs> and actually, um, Johan Johansson, um, IBM 1401. A, a user manual that's an amazing album um absolutely love it i don't know to be honest it's a bit more of a difficult question for me i i actually a lot of the time listen to like a lot of electronic stuff so i was listening to um a lot of the time i just recently listening to craft work because they're excellent but as far as like heavier music goes favorite favorite albums at the moment, probably um, Sumac. Their most recent release mm. is, is fantastic. It's, it's very like free form metal. It's very heavy. That that kind of thing is is very interesting to me. Um, and yeah. <laughs> It's it's very difficult for me to sort of pin it down to one thing, but I, I, I listen to a lot of those weird like bands that branch off from metal as well. Like one of my favorite bands is Earth. I think they're absolutely fantastic, and um and like the likes of um our sister Neurosis projects like like Sleep and Om, like oh, those bands. Yeah. yeah. Um and at the moment too, uh, like Monolord as well. I've been listening to Monolord quite a lot. 
They're a very good band. Uh, yeah. So that's a very poor explanation. But <laughs> you took more than us. I'm going to say it. Yeah. Um, actually, one, one last question, and let me know if this is maybe a bit too personal, David. How, how did that go, you getting to some of the more extreme forms of music coming from that religious background? Uh, internally, it wasn't too much of a struggle. I always kind of knew I liked what I liked, I guess. Um, and being in a religious family, it was it was very much a case of, you know, they wanted me to live up to a religious expectation. I even went to Bible college for a while. Uh, before leaving the church completely. Um, And when I left, it was the most liberating thing in the world because, like, all of a sudden it wasn't taboo to like the things that I liked. And um, it was was an amazing feeling. It was a, like, I I didn't know what to do with myself. It was was great. Um, So I guess the feeling of coming from that into this, great. Thanks again to Anna for talking to me. I don't have a recommendation this week. I have just been so busy. I've done four interviews in the last week, preparing for all of those, listening to all their music. They just didn't have an opportunity to listen to much other music, actually. Um, it's a little unfortunate, but I, I just want to briefly talk about the fact that these bands let me use their music in these episodes and how much I really appreciate it. So they've gone and spent, you know, as many as four years creating this music, spend their blood, sweat, tears. You know, it's an incredibly taxing process to put all this stuff together, all the time preparing, the the money they put into recording, you know, all, all this stuff. And they let me use this in interviews. Obviously, they're getting something out of it. They're including their music so people get a, get a bit more of a flavour of the kind of sounds that they're producing uh, accompanying the interview. I really appreciate it because they're giving something that they've gone so much effort to produce and allowing me to use it in my own production, you know, which I admittedly spend far less time preparing for each, for each band. And, you know, I, 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 if I was making music and I was releasing and I spent so much time on it, I would be really protective of it. And I think I might be a little bit hesitant, to be honest, to let other people use it in the way I'm using it. I, I try to be incredibly respectful. I try to, I try to use it as something that's promoting or giving a, a taste of the band. I don't want to include too much. No, I try to be incredibly respectful in that way. But, like, still, I, I think it's still a big ask to say... Oh, this music that you've worked so hard on, can I just use it, you know, in my own little production? And they've let me, or every band that I've asked so far has let me, and I am so grateful to them for letting me do that because I think it makes such a better episode, and I think it, it does such a better good job of communicating the kind of stuff that they're making, the amazing music they do. So to all the bands that have done so so far, to all the bands that I hope will do so in the future, I really appreciate it. And um, I, I thank you so much for giving me the permission to use this music, to use your creative outputs for my own creative outputs, the, you know, the limited amount that I contribute in this particular aspect. I'm going to have an interview later this week with Sumeru, their album coming out on the Friday. So I hope you enjoyed this episode and I hope you join me again later this week. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>